The Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Christian people who believe Jesus is the Son of God, the hope of the world, who died on the cross to redeem us all for eternal life with God. Our purpose is to lift Jesus up and love people in. Visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. And now be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen to a Bible message. Today's scripture will be found in Matthew 18, 10 to 14. I will be reading from the New International Version. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep, and one of them wanders away. Will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, it is happier, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Let's pray together. God in heaven, as Tim just sang, I think all of our hearts sing out the same thing, that we need you, Jesus, to come to our rescue. Um, We want to follow you wherever you lead, and we pray that today you would bless us as we open your word and we study. May we be followers, and may we acknowledge the fact that we need to be rescued, Father. I ask you would bless us today, whether we are here in person, wherever we are worshiping together, may we be reminded that the church is not a place, but a group of people. That you called disciples to be followers. And wherever someone is watching right now, whether it be currently or after the fact, Father, pray that you would bless them. You would guide them, that you would touch their hearts. That you would send angels to protect them and your Holy Spirit to guide them. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to take a second and think back to when you were young. Now, this means different things to different people. Um, Some of you, you may think, well, I was young, and it may be six, seven, eight years ago. Some of you, you may need to factor in several tens into that equation about when you were young. But I want you to think back to your first memories as a young child, whatever that is. Even if you're very young right now, say you're three or four years old, you can think back. What was it like? And I want you to think about what has changed since that time. What's different about the world today than it was when you were young? Consider this and think. Some of you had what was called a party line when you were young. And for those of you who are a little uh, not quite as experienced in life, a party line meant that you shared your phone line with several other houses right in your neighborhood, and then when you got on the phone, you might hear your neighbor having a conversation, you'd have to wait your turn, and I don't even know exactly how it all worked, because it wasn't my experience, but I guess it made eavesdropping a lot easier. Some of you might remember back to a time when uh, a household only had one car, right? It was just we had one car, and we did that. I had a church member when I was in Kansas, and he told me that he remembers a time when in his house there was no electricity. They had gas lights, and they had no running water. And this was in the 1950s. And he said that they didn't have a freezer. There was a co-op in town where they would keep the things they needed to be frozen. He said the only time he put on shoes was when he would go to the freezer because he had to be careful or his feet would stick to the floor of the freezer. Times have changed. And I share that with you so that we can have a little association with the changes that take place. And I want you to try and go in your minds, I'm going to fast, rewind back to the first century. In the first century, times were very different, particularly first century Palestine, which is the setting for our study today. In first century Palestine, it was very much an agricultural society. The main pursuit in life was growing food. Unless you were a noble, a priest, a king, your pursuit was growing, harvesting, trading so that you could feed yourself. 
This was done through growing wheat, corn, barley, things like this. Some people had orchards, uh, olive groves, um, grapes. And then there were the herdsmen, the ones who had sheep and goats and cattle. And this was the pursuit of life. This was what people did. This was what they spent time doing. Also, there was poor, if any, medical care. We didn't have, they didn't have the uh, science that we have today. They didn't understand how to treat infection like we do today. And the infant mortality rate was incredibly high. Most every family would have lost a child either at infancy or very young. To survive to adulthood was not guaranteed and maybe in some situations not even likely. If you were born into a poor situation, if you were born and your father died for some reason based on tragedy or sickness, life was a tough place for you. And because of this reality, because of that mortality rate for the young, because of the infections that went on, because of the situation of the time, there was an interesting reality in that culture that we have a hard time associating with today. And the thing, one of the things was, is that parents were slow to build connections with their children. And this was very much self-seeking because if they built a connection with their young baby or their toddler, there was a decent chance that that toddler would die. And so until the child became old enough to start working, there wasn't a lot of connection. There wasn't a lot of attachment. And that was just a cultural reality because of the reality of death. More than that, children had no standing. They had no rights in society. Now we, we do a lot of things to, to hold up and care for our children. We have systems that are built around it, and it's, it's an important part of the American culture, of our culture here at this church. We, we spend time on children's programs. We spend time on teaching child, uh, keeping children safe. That wasn't the case back then. Children had no standing, and children lacked the attachment that we think is normal today from their parents, simply because of the fact that the odds of them living to adulthood were greatly diminished compared to what we think of today. And it's in light of that we come to this teaching of Jesus. In the book of Matthew, you can turn there if you have your Bible, if you're watching, get on your phone, whatever. In the book of Matthew, we come in that backdrop to an important teaching of Jesus. And we're in our, uh, our Christ-like living series. We are Christians, right? We've come to know Jesus. We've experienced the goodness that is Christ death and resurrection. We've accepted that. I hope you have. If you haven't, that's the most important thing. And then Jesus says, come and live like me, act like me. What, is it, what does it look like in life when I am now living like my Savior in Christ-like living? We've been studying that. We'll be studying that through the end of August. Actually, the first week in September, we'll continue to study it. And in Matthew here, as Matthew was writing the gospel, there's, there's, there seems to be a literary kind of transition at this point in Matthew, in the beginning of Matthew 18, where he starts to uh, explain Jesus' teaching about what the kingdom of heaven was like. And so it's in this culture and in this time that Jesus starts to teach this. And his teaching here in Matthew 18, and we're actually going to look at kind of the first half of the chapter, and then in a few weeks we're going to look at the end of the chapter. But at the beginning of Matthew 18, it says, at that time the disciples came and asked Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So Jesus' teaching comes within this discourse and within this question. Who's the greatest, right? What does it mean to be great in the kingdom of heaven? And you've got to see that also in this culture, it was an important thing that humility in the Jewish teaching and in the Israelite community was very important, but it is thought of differently than we think of, well, maybe we think of humility now. And we see this throughout Jesus' teaching because he was, he, was, he was kind of adapting this process. A lot of times uh, there was great um, pride and humility, which I know sounds ridiculous to us, but in the culture, there were the, the, the practice was that if you could make some grand gesture, right, um, of humility, of giving, of sacrifice, you were looked on with praise. And maybe that's even um, the case today. If you're not familiar, there's a term called humble brag. It means that I'm humbly bragging about something like, oh, I'm so thankful that God has given me this, you know, whatever. It's a humble brag. 
And it was around at the time, and you would have this, and there are stories in the Gospels um, that, that illustrate this. For example, when Jesus talks about the people who are coming into the temple and giving these great donations, and then the widow who gives her small mite, and he says, she gave more. There's these teachings like this that Jesus calls out this, this hypocrisy, this, this teaching um, that goes on, this, this false humility. And this is something that happened. So the disciples ask in Matthew 18, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In verse 2 it says, he called a child, Jesus did, and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' initial response, and then as Jesus, many times Jesus did, he would, make, he would make a point and then he would illustrate it and he would flesh it out. But his overwhelming point here to the answer the question of who is the greatest is the greatest is the person who runs, who descends to the point of having no rights and no connection in society. That's the illustration that Jesus uses. We were having a conversation earlier and the reality is that children don't lack selfishness. <laughs> Children are, children are very e e able of being selfish, of caring for themselves. But Jesus says that in order to be great in the kingdom of heaven, about being Christ-like living, about having standing, is humbling yourself and being like a child. And I think particularly to his audience, this would mean that you have no voice. You don't have power. And you may seem isolated in your community. And then we would see that this would actually come and be fulfilled later in the, in the followers of Jesus, the way they were treated by society. He goes on and says, whoever welcomes one of these little ones, one of these ones without standing, without care, welcomes me. Whoever welcomes this one that, uh, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about them, right? And I often wonder, I don't know, we don't know what the child was. But when I think about this, I think Jesus probably pulled some orphan beggar kid. That's the way I see it. That's not in the Bible. We don't know what the child looked like. But I doubt that Jesus had the king's son standing next to him or daughter when he said this. He pulled a small child with no standing and said, you want to be great? Be humble. Humble yourself and become like this child. And when you welcome Someone of this standing, right? When you welcome someone of humble place, of someone without a voice, someone without power, you welcome me. He says, but anyone who causes one of these little ones to, <laughs> who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone tied around his neck and be drowned in the sea. There's great responsibility. And if we want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, humility is so important. And when we misrepresent that, and when we have someone in our midst who is, is lacking a voice, is lacking standing, is in a low place, isn't cared for, when we do something to alienate them, when we do something that is, it is condescending towards them, when we do something to lead them in, 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 a, in a negative path, Jesus says it'd be better, and he's using hyperbole here, and he uses it throughout. The upper millstone was this giant stone that the, the, the people would go, and they would come, and there would be one in the town, and they would put this on there, and it would grind the flour. If this was tied around your neck and you went in the water, you would have no chance. You would immediately sink to the bottom. And Jesus flushes out this statement by making it even more... Um, more poignant, he says, woe to you because of the things of this world cause you to sin. Such things must come. And then he uses the, 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 um, the illustration of self-mutilation, which isn't a teaching of Jesus, not a teaching of Scripture. It wasn't something that was practiced. But he's saying, when you come in and when you act in superior way and when you do not care for the one who is in need, like this child, without standing, without connection, you'd be better off losing an eye or losing an arm, losing a limb. And then he shares this parable. Starts in verse 10. He says, you see that, and this is an important thing, something that was humbling to me because Jesus makes a statement about the unseen world that for those of us who have standing, for those of us who have influence, for those of us who are loved, should be sobering. He says, you, uh, he says see that you do not look down on one of these little ones one of these people without those places. 
For I tell you the truth, their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And if you put this out, the teaching here, what Jesus is kind of alluding to, and scholars, they go back and forth on a little bit, but it's a general consensus that the angels of the ones who are less have this continual, continual spot in the presence of God where they are, they are, they are, they are interceding for these little ones. And so there's a direct connection to God for the ones who have less, who have a less standing in society. And Jesus has just taught that we are to treat those people, right? We are to treat them well. He says, what do you think? Verse 12, if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of, them fought, one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hill and go and look for the one that has wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, the Father in, our Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. And I think there's an important point here that we must understand from this teaching. Is that not only should we be humble and not seek this pride and authority and, and standing, but be humble like someone without, without uh, care, and without power. But we should also care for these type of individuals, these people with this standing in life. We should care for them and take it strongly, right? And not just the ones who may kind of fit with what we are comfortable with, but the ones that are wandering off, the ones that are going away. You see, the Father rejoices and is not willing that anyone should be lost. Even the one who chooses something bad, who makes a negative choice, right? We are to go out and go after them. And that's sobering because many times we as Christians say, well, here, come to my church and we'll help you fix things. Come and be like us. <laughs> and that's not the teaching that's here. The teaching is to go out. The teaching is to rescue you see, Jesus, I believe, is calling us to be rescuers of those who lack a voice, who lack standing, who lack power, and probably don't feel like they're cared for. And it's not because they've done something to deserve it. It's we're to rescue even when they have wandered off. And to be completely honest, as I read this and I think about it, and as I've been digesting it over the last 10 days or so, I, I realize I'm incapable. I am incapable of doing this. I naturally like some people more than others. I naturally associate and get along and understand people. And like I shared in the beginning, those of you who know what a party line is, you're gonna have a co connection with somebody else who used a party line, <laughs> right? We have this, this is part of life, this is part of growing up in societies and communities, we have connections. And it is only by the power of Jesus living my life that I will even become remotely capable of being what Jesus describes is great in the kingdom of heaven, being humble. And so first of all, before we move on, I want to say, and I want to make it abundantly clear to each person here, each person watching, my effort to prove or to stand on some, some moral high ground of, well, you know, I was helping that person down there, it's completely, completely misplaced. Our effort should be seek Jesus always. Seek his guiding and ask him for humility, because we will only be able to do these things that are taught here in Matthew 18 when that happens. It's about a surrender, and it's about, uh, there, there's a, a phrase I've become uh, acquainted with, it's called progress, not perfection. None of us are going to be perfect. And the day we stand on our perfection is the day we can be sure we are not perfect. So a rescuer of those without a voice. How does this apply to our world? <laughs> we live in a world 
in the United States at the moment where there's a lot of turmoil. And if I'm honest with you as I speak, as I was studying this, and you know, kind of the, 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 the common, you know, if you're gonna present, if you're a preacher, if you're a pastor, if you're a teacher, you're gonna go in and you're gonna open the Bible and you're gonna learn from a text, right? You're gonna try and understand what it meant to the people who read it and the, originally, the people who were there during the teaching. You try and understand that message and then you try and apply it to your current group that you associate with. And as I'm studying, I'm going, man, God, I really don't want to apply this because it's uncomfortable for me. Because we live in a world where racism and bigotry and discrimination has been on the forefront. And I don't feel that I am an expert on any of these things to speak with clarity or to prescribe what fixes the great divide we have in society. So I will share with you kind of my, my movement in, uh, in what I have thought the last few weeks and how I, what I, some things I've come to understand, some things I've come to accept, some things that I feel like God has convicted on my heart. So most of us saw several weeks ago a video of a man named George Floyd lying on the ground um, with a police officer's knee on his neck. We know the man died. Um, and when I saw that video, I was, I was disgusted. And our, you know, a guy confined on the ground being held down was disgusting. That's how I felt. And I thought of a couple times in my life where someone in authority had mistreated me, but that's kind of where it ended. Earlier this week, I was speaking to a friend who is uh, part of the African-American community, and we were talking about this, and he shared with me that since he saw that video, he was disgusted, and then he's been having nightmares because he said, I saw myself on the ground when I saw that video. This friend actually is the one who officiated my wedding, a very close friend. And it hit me because I think, man, we had this, the, the immediate reaction was disgust. We had the same disgust. But I have no association with that experience, so I don't see myself there. And that, that shook me up a little bit. Because there's a community of people who when they see something that's disgusting, they say, well, that's my reality. And I'm just, I, that, that's not my experience. It's just not it. And it's, it's, it's sad, it's saddening to me, it's frightening. And that led me to think of, well, where in my life, what, what other things do I not, what, else, what other things do I not associate with? And I started thinking about it, and I don't know, locally here, if you're watching abroad, it may not be the case, but locally here in some of, uh, the, there's a Walmart just down the road that I, I go to uh, fairly regularly, and in that Walmart in the last year and a half or so, they have, they've started, um, there'll be somebody as you're walking out, and they'll check your receipt, right, as you're walking out of the Walmart. This happens in other stores. I will say that when I walk out of that Walmart, I almost never have my receipt checked. <laughs> in fact, I'll ask sometimes, oh, do you need to check my receipt? They say, no, you're good. <laughs> now, I don't know what the experience is of somebody else, but I would bet that if you looked different than me, you'd have your receipt checked more than I did. I don't know. I'm fairly certain that I, I receive some type of privilege because what is in society and what society portrays that looks like me is not the thing that gets the negative attention. It's just not the case. That's my experience. Now, I make some effort to be kind to people. And so when I walk into the store, I try and smile at the person standing there and say hello, right? When I'm walking out, I try and make eye contact. And so, I think there is value in being friendly, but the question is, is how am I helping someone else to understand the value of friendliness? Because there may be young people, there may be people of different ethnic background, black people, brown people, Asian people, who are treated differently 
people who have a tattoo on their face who are treated differently? And how do I help them to, to, to understand that friendliness is valuable? I don't know that that's going to change much. But the thing that moved me the most, and I want to make it very clear as I share this story, this is not an equivalency of what happened to George Floyd, and it's not an equivalency to those in, in, in the African American, the black community, who have experienced uh, negative results by those in power who are supposed to serve in the air. This is not equivalent, but it was helpful for me. So I was thinking, and May 1st of this year, uh, I always think I can share the story without getting emotional, but I never can. Um, May 1st of this year was the five-year um, five anniversary of uh, of my nephew passing away. So May 1st, 2015, I get a phone call. Uh, my 18-year-old nephew was driving to school, got in a car accident, and died. And I actually thought about this because earlier this week, I'm scrolling through Facebook and a video pops up, a memory. A memory of my nephew, Devin. And the reaction is similar to what's happening now. My son, who's going to be born in the next couple of weeks, his, his, one of his middle names is Devin in memorial. So this happens, right? And I have this this emotional, visceral reaction, because I miss my nephew. And if somebody came to me right now and said, you know, well, 50,000 people a year die in car accidents, <laughs> I would have a hard time thinking kind thoughts towards that person. Or if somebody came to me and said, well, he was probably speeding, so he should have been more safe. <sighs> I'd probably break something. I'd throw a fit. Somebody came to me and said, well, maybe he should have slept more, or maybe he'd, he'd been on some type of substance that changed his reaction skills. And I understand that that's how society reacts to the black community when they say black lives matter, when we say, well, all lives matter. Well, of course all lives matter, but right now, somebody I love and somebody I associate with, I see somebody on the ground dying, and I see myself. It's like somebody coming to me, and when I say my nephew died in a car accident, they say, well, you know, he should have been driving slower. It's just the, the picture of insensitivity. And I didn't really understand that until this week. So what do we do? We're in a pretty homogenous community. Most of you are part of this church. We're mostly upper, middle, upper class white people. <laughs> and that's who we associate with. And, and I, I think, I know that there are great hearts in this community. I know that there are people who, they don't have a discriminatory bone in their body, but they also don't necessarily put themselves in the situations very often to connect, humble themselves like someone without a voice. So what do we do? And I don't have a lot of answers. Definitely don't have answers on the big picture, on society. But I received, somebody said to me, and this was a few years back, there's a guy, he's a pastor named Derwin Gray. He's an ex-NFL player, has a pastor down in, um, he's an African-American gentleman who has a, a church down in Charlotte, and he said this. He said, what you can do on a personal level is use what power or privilege or authority or influence you have to help someone who doesn't. And I think that's what Matthew 18 is saying. And that is greatness in the kingdom of heaven. And if that means 
coming along someone who's looked down on. That's what we're called to do. And I would say the most important thing, because we as humans like to talk about deserving, right? As young children, well, that's not fair. <laughs> the message of Jesus, and what I believe the message of Matthew 18, and what I, mean, what I believe being a rescuer is all about, is rescuing not the ones who deserve it, not the ones who have acted correctly, not the ones who have responded in a way that you think is appropriate, but using whatever you have to help someone who has left, regardless of whether you think they deserve it or not. Because ultimately, Jesus came and he did exactly that for you and me. Exactly that, because we didn't deserve it. At no point have we started to deserve it. And he took his power, his privilege, his authority, his standing, and he humbled himself and became like the one who had no standing, who'd given up their standing, had no voice, who'd surrendered to sin. So that he could lift them to a status that they didn't deserve. So be a rescuer. And I don't know what that looks like for you. I know for me, it's thinking about how can I use the blessings that I have to help someone who has less, and particularly those in communities that have been mistreated. And there's 400 years of, of mistreatment of the African-American community in America. Like, you, many of you lived through, some of you lived through when uh, segregation was broken up in schools. My ancestors who came to America from Belgium and Italy in the early 1900s immediately had more rights than the black community who'd been here for hundreds of years as Americans, immediately. It's real. My, great, my grandmother in the 1920s was not told you had to go to this school or that school. It didn't happen. So how do we use it and how do we specifically use it for those in need? And there's a significant need. And I heard something on, on, uh, on the news this week and I hope it's true. Someone said, I think we've finally turned a corner. I'm hopeful. So how can you be a rescuer to those that don't deserve it, who don't have the privilege and the standing that you have, deserved or undeserved? That's the main question I want you to consider in your bulletin here. The last one says, how has God called you to be a rescuer? There are some other questions that if you're watching and you're in your family groups, I encourage you to discuss those as well. If you're here, discuss those with your family afterward. But that's the main thing. How has God called you to be a rescuer, particularly to those who don't deserve it? Let's pray. Jesus, I ask you to be with us. Guide us, because we will never be faithful to the teaching today by our own power. But the beauty is, is we weren't called to do it by our own power. We were called to do it by the power of Christ living in us in Christ-like living. May we be rescuers to those in need. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We trust your relationship with God has been strengthened from what you have heard today. Please visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. May God give you His peace and joy.